Konnichiwa. Welcome to the Jandals in Japan podcast. Kia ora, Catherine. Welcome to October. It's great to be here. here <laughs> My favourite month what of the year. We turned the clock forward so fast, but it's amazing, right? I love this season. Yay, it's autumn in Japan. It's autumn, which means it's Koromogai season. <gasps> right, yeah. I haven't done that yet. What's no, Koromogai? <laughs> I know what it is, but what is it? What is it? So <laughs> it is a time of the year when you swap your clothes over from summer to winter or sort of warmer clothes and generally has a set date in Japan where this needs to happen. And if you're working in a company or going to a school, there'll be a date when you will need to change over from your summer uniform into your winter uniform. And if your company is doing cool biz, which is when they turn all the aircon up really high so that oh, you feel yes. horrible and hot uh, to save energy. You don't have to wear your normal suit jacket and tie. You can wear something a little bit cooler, a summer mm -hmm. suit or a no tie or short sleeves. But from Koromogai day with the day of changing your clothes over, you have to revert back to winter attire, yes, whether it's hot though. outside or not. <laughs> The toilet seats start getting warmed up oh, around yes. now too, don't they? Yes, they turn the toilet oh. heaters back on a bit warmer. If it's they've still been a little off. too early for that. But <laughs> <laughs> it's caring for people, isn't it? It's all about caring for people. Mm -hmm, um, you know, mm -hmm. They might be starting to feel chilly, so we should put you those want you to have to toilet seats on again. <laughs> brace yourself before you sit down. Uh, <laughs> I remember taking, I have to say, I remember taking my kids back to New Zealand and it was winter. And they were crying because they're like, mommy, I can't sit on the cold toilet seat. And I was like, my yeah. poor ch spoiled children. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you haven't changed your clothes over yet. I haven't oh, changed no. mine over yet. No, but I haven't done it yet. I've also saw on the TV that it's not a good idea to do it when it's mm. still very hot mm. and there's a lot of humidity in the air because then when you put your clothes away, you will also increase the chances of them getting moldy once they're put away. So it's better to wait till they're just Good very point. thoroughly dried out before you Good actually point. do that. So okay, this is, is a, I have an excuse to delay my Yes. You're waiting <laughs> for the humidity okay. to decrease. Right. And so this is a kind of a very high level housewifing you can learn if you watch daytime TV, which I happened to just turn it on the other day and that was what was on. Uh, but I also actually attended a etiquette course recently, mm. um, which was run by one of my uh, longtime friends here in Japan. And she's an etiquette teacher. She knows everything about everything about doing wow. the right way. And we were talking about the seasons and she was saying that Koromogai is not only just changing your clothes, but also recommitting to what you're doing or sort of giving yourself a bit of a jazz up for the rest of the year kind of thing. Kiai or ireru in Japanese. So never yeah. thought of it that way that's very interesting and goodness i hadn't thought at all about that the aspect of it rather than the practical aspect of it's getting cold so i should put my warm clothes into the closet i didn't think about that as a, a feeling inside and a way of a mindset change as yeah. well the change of season yeah mm. it's kind of like um what's popular now september is the other january you know how we have this sort of thing that goes around on social media like september is the new january or the other january or sort of like a, a fresh start you know for the rest right. of the year i thought um, that was just to help people get more consulting and start new programs well is that have that people pay well. them for it <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Mm. That makes sense. I love mm. it. Yeah. Mm. Changing of your energy. That's really, really awesome. Yeah. Mm. I get that. What yeah. kind of things did she teach you? There's so much to learn for Japanese etiquette and a lot of inquiries that we get on channels in Japan is what do I do with this or that? Or it's generally about etiquette. Um, yes. How, how do I, you know, not offend people when I hand over my business card or what mm. should I dress like? So uh, you could spend years and years learning this. You'll never learn all of it. What I did learn at the uh, seminar was that the Japanese people also do not know. So it's okay. They are not perfect at this either. And just even just giving it a little bit of a go is very appreciated though, right? Wow. So, yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? When you think Japanese people know everything about etiquette, but actually I, not. Yeah. No, Were there they any don't. examples that she gave? 
the crowd at this etiquette seminar was from a variety of ages from sort of mid 30s right up to your 80s late 80s there were a lot of elderly people there as well madly writing notes so i was very surprised that you know some people were refreshing their memories or whatever they were doing i don't know but what it all came down to she says or what etiquette is is you thinking about the other person right and that sounds pretty simple Mm. but actually in our daily lives how often do we think about other people as we go about our day it's a golden rule isn't it Mm. it sounds like that yeah and so one very simple thing that she did mention was when you are for example in a bank or in a shop and you've been given Mm. a piece of paper to fill out or maybe Mm. you're checking into a hotel for example you have to fill out a piece of paper And then when you give it back to the person, just rotating the paper so that when you hand it back, they're looking at it the right way up. Oh, right. It's a super simple piece of etiquette, right? But how often do we forget to do that, especially these days? Very good point. Mm. Even if you just gave that a try next time and see, wow, what a difference it makes to your interaction by Mm. thinking about the other person as you hand the paper back to them. You also see that, you know, when they give you get your credit card back in a shop, they generally turn it around so it's facing you when it's handed over. So how about turning it to face them when when you yes. hand it over, you know, like just taking that teeny tiny moment yeah, to do moment. something. Hmm. Now I'm going to be nervous. Now what should I do here? I've got <laughs> I'll be in that situation. I'll be remembering what you've just said and think, hang on, am I doing this the right way? But actually if you do it enough, it probably becomes yeah, uh, it becomes second natural. nature. Right. Yeah. Mm, How yeah. excellent. So, so we're not going to dive into all of the etiquette in Japan here because we'll net this episode will go on for several years if we try to. But I think it's this attitude of, A, looking around, opening your eyes, seeing what people are doing, and also thinking of the other person. It can go a very long way. And you'll start to learn some of the etiquette in Japan right. just by opening your own eyes and it sounds like to me jane she's a great person you can ask anything you want to that to her she's an expert in her field right and she's the one to ask about etiquette we need people like that in our lives Mm. well i hope we can bring her on the show soon and or maybe a part of the show and get her to introduce some things to us so we can all improve our etiquette and i think you know this etiquette would be received well in the rest of the world so who do we have on the show today catherine well, speaking of experts, Jane, as you just mm. were, we've got Chisa Ogura from Meros Consulting on the show. My goodness, is she not an expert? I don't know if I've met an, a greater expert in Japan. Oh, no. She is That's fantastic. She knows about the market and sales channels and everything here about food and beverage. Uh, and I really am so pleased to introduce her. And I thank NZTE Craig Pettigrew for the initial introduction to Chisa. She's been fabulous along the way all kinds of tips and it's just a great time to have her on the show today yes so let's hear from chisa kia ora chisa welcome to jandals in japan it's great to have you on the show today thank you jane and uh, thank you for your warm regards good morning chisa nice to see you great so we have a warm-up question for you chisa a or b Okay, so it's getting kind of cooler now and we're starting to want to have more warming foods. Are you oden or nabe? Mm, I would say nabe. Oh, why nabe? What's your favorite nabe also? Yeah. My most favorite nabe is the pork belly, using pork mm-hmm. belly and pork belly. Uh, and the haksai, mm-hmm. and the, the Chinese cabbage. Yes. And uh, just that it, and uh, it has a really the dense text texture because of the nice fatty. Yeah, and the it make, Yeah, and it makes me very warm and this, <laughs> and very easy. <laughs> is it just the plain soup then? What's the soup? It's plain soup with just salt and a little dashi, and okay. uh, mm-hmm, that's Not it. Very simple. Mm. Very simple and easy to cook. How about you, Catherine? Oden or nabe? Oh, a hot nabe. pot for those who don't know the word nabe. nabe. Yeah. Hot pot all the way for me. And I'm mm. not a pro on knowing the varieties, but I do know that I really like ones with lots of mushrooms in them. And I don't know if that's a mushroom oh. nabe or is it just haksai? Haksai, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chinese mm-hmm. cabbage and mushrooms for some reasons mm. coming up for me. But oden, mm, not my favorite. I don't know. Oh. I feel like oden 
sort of takes away the uh, vitamins and nutrition, the way it's cooked, but I might be wrong there. It's my bias towards <laughs> Oden, but I do love uh, hot pot nabe. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it took me a long time to even try Oden because I used to see it in the convenience store and think that looks disgusting. It's because how many hours <laughs> has that been sitting there stewing on the counter? How many people yeah. walked past that and That's sneezed it. on it? And But then when we actually made it in my own home for the first time, uh, with the help from my husband, because obviously I don't know what I'm doing. I was like, oh, this is actually quite nice. And it's um, useful just to have it. Like you could go for three meals with or Dan sitting. Yeah, because it doesn't like go off because, <laughs> right? Is there it could... any nutrition? I just want someone to tell There's me. There's lots of fish in there. It's oh. fish, right? <laughs> Different kinds of fish, konyaku mm -hmm. and uh, konyaku potatoes mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. daikon, right? So daikon. Yeah, I love daikon, I have to say. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. And but egg. I'm, and yeah, eggs. and eggs. Mm -hmm. it's true, mm -hmm. true. All um, right. But I am a hot pot person as well. I would love a good tongkotsu or pork bun ah. soup with uh, udon in it. And yeah, it's really good. That's our family favorite easy dinner that children will eat a lot of vegetables. And so <laughs> we're all for the nabe season mm. coming. Yeah, oden and nabe, very easy. Yeah, we love those cooking on your table mm. kinds of dinners. Right, Very you can fun. have them yeah. at a restaurant too. Can't you go to a nabe restaurant and have yeah. a, select what you'd like and have it with your friends yes. going out yeah. for dinner? So anyone visiting Japan can actually try them in the coming season, right? That's yeah, right. shabu shabu mm. is the very mm. easy way. Yeah, shabu, what, shabu oh. restaurants are very fun, aren't they? Lots yes, of, uh -huh. the delicious things. Yes, lots that's of things great. to look to. <laughs> that's great. We're talking about food because that's the reason why we've got Chisa on the show today because. Anyone who is really looking to be successful in food and drink in Japan, in a market like Japan, right? You have to really have a deep and ongoing understanding of the mm -hmm. consumer needs and distribution channels here. And we've got Chisa on the show because she is a specialist advisor to people who want to do all of those things, who have to understand cultural expectations in terms of flavors and packaging and knowing what sort of retailers and distributors want. And so Chisa, you've had like 20 years or more experience and research and problem solving mm -hmm. around this area. And we thought you'd be fabulous to have on the show because your company, Miros Consulting, is doing this actively every day and helping governments as well. So we wanted to have you here. We thank you for coming. Uh, we will be putting your full bio on the, show, <laughs> on the show notes, but tell us about your background your inspiration for starting this business that you've got, why you chose the name Meros, and about the services and things that you do for people here. Yes, Kathleen, thank you so much for your the long, warm uh, introduction. That uh, My background is a major at the university, studying from agriculture economics. I was uh, interested in the trade and the politics, and uh, especially I was really fascinated in how important agriculture and food is everybody needs to eat food uh, every day and uh, also that's also linked to the soil and the land and the history mm -hmm. and that's attracted me a lot but the uh, key reason i started my the new company called Mel's consulting seven eight years ago and that is because i had a great team the four partners founded this company together the one two from Japan, including me, and one from Europe and one from US. So we thought we can collaborate each other and I can tell what the international people are interested in and how we can explain about the Japanese culture in a way, very dedicated way to the client. And Kathleen brought a great point. Thank you. And the Meros is a name of a, a company that came from the very ancient Greek name. Uh, that it's uh, different parts coming together. So we thought this kind of diversified team for different members coming together become our company Mero. So we are hoping we can bring diversity into the Japanese society <laughs> is one of our hopes. Definitely. Mm. And you just had some new members join the team as well, bringing more diversity. 
Ah, yes. Uh, we hired one Japanese boy uh, that uh, maybe three, four years ago. And uh, just recently, we hired another Indian lady. She has a background of uh, biology and started international agriculture in Todai and got PhD over there and did postural doctor work over there. And we scouted her. <laughs> oh, building the team that's so yeah exciting. she has a really great leadership and they included the different aspects of the, of the south asian uh, nation now so you recently moderated a panel discussion in front of jacinda ardern when she visited japan uh, back in april 2022 mm -hmm. on her trade mm -hmm. mission to japan so please tell us a little bit about that experience and what did you share with the audience when she visited can you give us an inside story hi uh, yes jen thank you the new zealand embassy was uh, planning the trip of the jishin Dardan, and uh, one of the component was related to food uh, because that is one of the most important export products from new zealand to japan so that they make the lunch show for the Japanese and the New Zealand journalists who come into that tours. It was a business delegate tour, including the food related companies. So they planned a panel discussion in, before the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern to speak about the importance of the New Zealand food industry and how sustainable that in New Zealand. And uh, so we discussed about the food innovation and what will be interesting new innovation in New Zealand and what will be best fit for the Japanese industry. So that is the things we discussed uh, in front of the journalists. But one thing is that uh, because the, that was the an appetizer before the main dish and the Prime Minister J Jacinda's speech. So actually in the middle of the discussion, a panel discussion, Jacinda arrived at the venue. So we were kicked off from the stage. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, that was so funny. The oh. discussion was uh, finished in the very middle, but uh, oh, that was okay. Like, <laughs> the waiter or waitress taking the appetizer away from the table and serving the main dish before oh, you yes. finish the appetizer. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I love that analogy about to food anyway. So I think Jane was going asking you too about the, the, mm -hmm. the trends or the things that you talked about that you were able to share before you were yeah, uh, what, what, swiped off what, the table. What, what, did tell, what did you tell people who were there? They must have been waiting to hear what you had to say. What did you tell them? <laughs> the first thing is that the, I share two big picture trends in the Japanese food and agri-space, which driving the innovation. And uh, one is Japanese food security. And, uh, you guys are living in Japan so for many years, so you may have aware of that, but uh, this concern is huge in Japan. And Japan still has the sixth largest agriculture industry in the world. It's a kind of mm. huge agriculture industry, but about 70% of food by value is domestically produced, but another 30% is imported, including New Zealand. But the Japanese agriculture is reaching, reaching the edge of the Grief. A couple of the Jandao speakers already mentioned about it, but before, but the Japanese farmers' age became about sixty-eight yes. years old this year, and uh, this means a huge number of farmers will retire soon because yes. you can think continue farming during your sixties, but uh, in seventies it's really hard. I think. So this is the aging farmers and the dec declining the domestic agriculture is the fundamental opportunity for New Zealand products. And also New Zealand has a great technology, agri-tech technology, and New Zealand is also facing a labor issue in agriculture space. So there's a big innovation in that area. So that kind of things also can contribute to Japan. It was one thing I shared. Yeah, this aging farmers. So... My father-in-law is a farmer. He's oh. 78 and he's up every morning at like 4.30 out there farming his melons and long potatoes in Totori, feeding mm. the people of Osaka. That's where most of the produce goes to. But yeah, when I visit and I walk around the fields, I see extremely elderly people out there doing the farming. There are mm. no young people doing it. They're mm. all around the similar kind of age. And yeah, these people are potentially not going to be able to farm much longer. So no. yeah, how, what's going to happen that 
it's really a big problem here in Japan. Mm. Yeah, my husband. Yes, mm. my husband family also doing farming, but mm-hmm. we don't know what to do after they yeah. re- they decide to retire. And, Nobody um, wants to take over the next generation. Like the next generation, generally not interested to take over, right? No, and yeah. we we are not there, being no, there, so, there. <laughs> <laughs> physically there. So it's quite hard. Quite hard, isn't it? Well, so what's the Japanese government doing then to help in this area? I mean, it's a it's a systemic problem, isn't it, within the whole of Japan and, and mm-hmm. New Zealand as well? Is the government doing anything, any other strategies to help out here? Yeah, the Japanese government is really putting energy to enlarge the agriculture farming entities, the company who can take over those the available land in the local area. But it's not doing pretty well that uh, there is uh, many fundamental reasons. But one thing is really restricting that transition is because the Japanese agriculture land is scattered and it's mm. under the U- U.S. administration after the World War II. The land was distributed to the tenant. Mm-hmm. Uh, it used to be that there was a big landlord, but mm-hmm. uh, that makes many poor families send the people out from the village and eventually it contributed the Japan to become the more unstable society that's become unstable and that the U.S. really afraid to be Japan to become a communist like a Soviet Union. So they distributed the land to the many smallholders and they, that continues still now and I, it's really a difficult problem to solve. Yeah, you can mm. see the individual small pieces of land that mm. each family has and then trying to figure out who owns what to buy it or uh, use it or borrow it must be very difficult and time consuming. It's really it, time consuming yeah. Yeah. to gather those cat that land together. Yeah. And mm. very tiny pieces like one soccer field, less than one soccer field less size, than, yeah. right? <laughs> and then, yeah. Oh. About one hectare, about mm-hmm. one to two hectare is the average farm size. So it's quite tiny compared mm-hmm. to the New Zealand scale. And all these little farm owners are selling their products to the distribution network, right? And to getting it sold into the market. So it must be very complicated. And that's why I think someone like you who understands how that works must be very important to help say New Zealanders coming in here who don't really know about that. New Zealand farms are so much bigger, aren't they? They're yes. <laughs> we do have a more cottage industry or a smaller farms too, but it's it's a different situation. So you must help them with that sort of mindset difference, right? And explaining what it's like here. So, yeah? yeah, the distribution channel is also very diversified and very connected to the to the very small scale farm size. And so it's quite important for the New Zealand to have, also to have a strategy to attack one by one. Uh, the attack only one big distributor or the big detailer is not the end of your story. You need to have a good system to attack individual, the small retailers and the small distributors. And that is mm. the, one of the key difficulties to, to have a big success in the Japanese market. What are some of the things that New Zealand is doing really well that you can see from your experience and knowledge compared to other countries? Uh, the one really good example is the this plea that uh, it's a kiwi fruits brand and uh, they are, they had a really good success in Japan. They have a putting a lot of money in marketing and uh, it attracted a lot of Japanese very normal consumers, uh, their interest. They have uh, using uh, nice characters and also... Uh, oh, the Kiwi Brothers, yes? Yeah, uh... Kiwi Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Many people want the do- those of Kiwi Brothers. And also mm. they recently released the Ruby Red, one of their very most innovative uh, the Kiwi Fruits. It's the uh, the color of the fruits is red. The yes, outside yes. is similar color, but the inside is red, and it's beautiful. And it was very well received by Japanese consumers. Mm. Mm. Delicious too. 
it very, was very nice. really delicious. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very... for a short time, wasn't it? A short term project. Is that correct? It's the very short time harvesting period, I think. And uh, mm. for the green kiwi fruit, you can keep for one year almost, and uh, you can supply during whole year. Mm. But the red, the yellow variety is weak, so you can supply only half of the year. And the red is not sweet for the long term storage, so you need very narrow window oh, okay so it's very seasonal mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. very yeah, seasonal explains. i was surprised at just how well known the kiwi brothers are how many japanese people know who they are and love them and i went to my facial salon and we were talking about new zealand or something and i said oh do you know the kiwi brothers and <laughs> my and the salon owner was like yes of course they're, they're so great and i'm like really you know them oh my goodness so even in a very small town in Tohoku in Japan, people know Kiwi Brothers. This is amazing. Well, apparently, I feel. it's one of the most. It is the the most favorite CM commercial on TV. Is the Zespri advertisements? They don't even me mention New Zealand. It's mm. the Kiwi Brothers. I think that's yeah. why, and so I think probably people watch and take it in, and they're cute advertisements, right? People are dancing around, and <laughs> nice lyrics, and so maybe that's it. It's getting into the psyche of uh, Japanese who love mascots and things like that. Mm. that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's very well designed, and they also have a strong social network strategy yeah. so they invited the ordinary people to do or a lot of the uh, video. Now, how can I say that the don't want people also can attend the bit creating a commercial video through a social media campaign, and that mm -hmm. also was really popular. And mm. I think it took uh, some kind of award of the year. Um, mm. Yeah, right. It's great, isn't it? It's really fantastic mm. seeing these collaborations and that there's this international New Zealand coming into Japan and helping. And we remember that Ian Kennedy, who was one of our previous our guests on the show talked about a company in New Zealand that's partnered with, I think it was Yamaha, around automated apple harvesting. And I think you were going to talk to us today a little bit about that example too, and give us a bit more uh, flavor, shall we say. <laughs> Can you tell us about that collaboration? Because I think that's really good example for people to think about who are listening. Uh, that may not be quite obvious, but it's a really great way to see how a New Zealand company has collaborated with a Japanese company in this mm. agri-tech area. Yeah, I think that is uh, one really good example. The company name was Abandoned Robotics, and uh, that is an uh, Apple automated harvester. And the New Zealand Apple industry, is, as I said, also facing a very difficult problem of labor, scarce labor in agriculture area. Mm -hmm. And the COVID makes it more difficult. And now the many apples are on trees and there was nobody who can take. So just the apple was abandoned on the tree. So that was really a sad story. So they are putting a lot of effort there. But the Japanese uh, industry is also in in working in that, that area hard. So they are now putting a lot of resources, the new technology development. Also, they are looking for the open innovation. So the many of Japanese companies started the corporate venture capital during the last two, three years. So Yamaha was one of them who have an arm to have an investing in those kind of new technology startups. And uh, I think now that is working with T and G, T Turn and Grower growers mm. and what, growth, yes. yeah mm. it's uh, yeah. one of the biggest apple grower and yes. exporter sure in is. New Zealand, and uh, they are testing that robot at their field mm. it's amazing yeah have you I've... seen it how it works have you seen a video or seen it in in reality how it works uh, it's just video i haven't visited the, <laughs> the site but this uh, it's a uh, really the uh, very interesting i will share it <laughs> later. Yeah, I, I think i can share it later yeah. mm -hmm. ian was saying that it actually realize mm. recognizes the sizes as well mm. so it's in the right place the one mm. that is the right size within that particular box so they're all the same so it's very intuitive and really incredible abundant robotics Excellent. yes yes well, mm -hmm. shout out that's fantastic <laughs> And hopefully we'll see a bit more of that now that this border restriction uh, that Japan has had in place will lift on the 11th of October. And I already know a few New Zealand companies who are coming in on that day, mm. oh. which is super exciting to hear. Uh, really, really exciting. 
Yeah, I think it's really a best timing that the, during the pandemic, the Jap, the almost two three years, there was there was quite difficult for the Japanese company also to send their staff to abroad. So their desire for the international collaboration is really the hike now. So、yeah. they are very open to for new collaboration. Hmm, yeah, and you pointed out、news. to us、yeah. too that you know New Zealand、mm. has had really a long-term relationship with Japan. Like Ansco and Fintera, you told us before the show, have actually had five decades, fifty years of relationship. Yes,、right? indeed, indeed.、Mm -hmm. And the、uh, Japanese food processors also、uh, is really working collaborate with them, and that、uh, they. Created the new technology dedicated for the Japanese market for many many years,、mm. but、uh, yeah, that's his kind of very long stand relationship is really valuable, and then you can add more new innovation and startups right. and、so、that kind of thing. Keep the relationship、um, yeah. buoyant, right? Keep it going by just not resting on your laurels with having fifty years, but doing more、mm. to make、mm. it innovative. Very interesting. What、um, is trending in your industry and in Japan right now? And、uh, one thing is, I think it's a、uh, the space that the New Zealand is quite、uh, strong, but it's sustainability.、Mm. That、uh, maybe Kathleen and Jane are meeting a、uh, many Japanese traditional, the large companies, and so you can aware of the the colorful, the circle, the、yes. rainbow color, <laughs> ESG mark. <laughs> Everybody putting that、uh, that pin on their suits. Yes. yes. <laughs> Like、SDGs, right? SDGs, SDGs lay down a little badge. People、yes. love、Sustainable. wearing those in Japan. Yes, and many and of、that. them are getting to know what they actually mean as well. <laughs> <laughs> But that became a really buzzword, and ESG and the carbon neutral are becoming a kind of fundamental elements of the Japanese company's business planning. And the last two years, that was、uh, more like、uh, the big picture was wrote down by the money. Management team, and、uh, starting from last year and this year, it's trickled down into the、uh, actual business level. So that each individual division started to think about it and、uh, need to show how they can move toward that the big picture goals, which was set by the headquarters.、Uh, that、mm -hmm. is becoming really a trend in the Japanese industry. So now we see many people really desperate to find a sustainable sourcing of the the technology or the sourcing of food products or the ingredients. So that is really a good trend for the New Zealanders, I think. It's interesting you say it's taken two years、mm -hmm. to tr to trickle down to the actual doing things. Yeah, from just think from just the strategizing at the top. To、mm. actual being actually in action, in yeah. Business,、right? yeah. Ha, have、mm. you ever heard of ESG investing? The investors started to move toward the ESG, that the environment sustainable and the、uh, environment, environment social and the governance sustainable direction. And uh, now uh, it's originally started from the Europe, but the、uh, GPF, the Japanese, the The pension fund started to implement that concept, so that every investment they make, they need to think about the ESG concept during the investment stage. So now、mm. that the Japanese pension fund, that that the government fund is one of the largest shareholder of the Japanese companies, and they are buying up lots of shares there from the public market. And、once they asking questions for the corporates that the, you need to change in that direction, what are you doing act in action in in terms of ESG? Now the corporates needs to think about it, especially the management level, because that impacts the value of the company.、Mm -hmm. And、yeah. so, so it came from really a top. <laughs> yeah, you're so right. Those、Ooh. investors have got a, a voice,、mm. and the you know the stakeholders in the company, and they are putting pressure on the boards. Mm. Right to be to, to be delivering investment back to the shareholders, and so they're putting pressure on right through their、uh, aiming for ESG. Right, be this, do this.、Uh, so they've really got a voice, and I think maybe people wouldn't really know very much about the fact that the Japanese pension fund is is quite a big investor in lots of different companies.、Mm. Powerful, I love it. No, yeah, very powerful. Very interesting.、Mm. 
And then in terms of like, you know, you're dealing with supermarkets and retailers every Mm -hmm. single day, I believe. And we just heard that Costco opened up in New Zealand. um, And that's quite a revolution for New Zealand. But Costco has been around for a while in Japan. So what some of the trends or that you've seen with Costco operating in Japan that might be of use or helpful for people who are just getting used to the idea in New Zealand and don't really know about the importance or usefulness of Costco as it operates in Japan. Any tips or hints there? Yeah, Costco is really a unique player in Japan and uh, they now have about 30 outlets in Japan and aiming to double the number in the next few years so they are quite expanding a lot and uh, very quickly what's very special of Costco is they handling their imported products by themselves so the Costco headquarters in US is has a kind of accounts of customers and uh, exporters and uh, they have some varieties of the what what is available uh, and uh, so that Japanese uh, that Costco can acquire directly from the exporters. So there's a many the imported food products like New Zealand uh, meat or the wines in the shelves in the very big portion. So that is quite different from the local, the normal food supermarkets. And um, the Japanese, many consumers look for very rare and unusual food products at Costco. So that actually our survey shows that about the 6% of consumers who go to Costco is with friends and share their products they purchased with it's friends. It's like Disneyland of supermarket shopping, isn't it? Like they go with their friends <laughs> yes. and they spend uh-huh. all day there and look at everything and, mm. and have lunch in the food court area. And it's a real event to go to Costco. I, I see that when I go there. Mm. That's huge, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's, it's a destination. It is it's totally a destination. They handle the very huge volume. So anyway, it won't fit with your the tiny kitchen that normal Japanese mm. have. So. <laughs> <laughs> did you say mm. there that the exporter, so someone who's exporting meat or wine from New Zealand can deal directly with Costco. They don't have to worry about anybody in between. No. Basically. Basically, right, right, right. It's right. a different, it's a complete revolution isn't it, to yeah. how mm. things are being done right now. Do you think that's really going to disrupt the market then if Costco are planning to double the number of stores in the next couple of years? Yeah, the overall food market is actually shrinking because of the the population. Like a by maybe it's not not just drastic shrinking, but the by like a 0.5% shrinking or something. But there is a huge demand for those kind of imported food products so that, and also the very interesting destination and the shopping experience. So that is the space why Costco are expanding their businesses and uh, probably they also see the same uh, the gap in New Zealand and that have a, provide the international selection of the many interesting food products Mm -hmm. and that would be very fantastic and not only the Costco is doing this kind of things in Japan and the Gyom Super or the Kaudi or the Hanamasa and some other players are doing the same things but the targeting different audience Mm -hmm. like uh, Costco is targeting the a little suburb area and the large volume things but the Gyom Super and Kaudi are targeting the city centers and they have small outlets but the same direct import from them. Uh, the international mm-hmm. exporters and uh, they are also doing pretty well so there is a huge uh, demand there I think. Definitely mm. I also frequent Gyom Super and Kaldi and I was out there on the weekend actually in Kaldi looking and I just was there to get my Vegemite which it's you know <laughs> very important <laughs> but I was I took a moment to sort of look around and see what other people were doing and people were really enjoying themselves mm. looking at all the products and what does this do and how, can we can I use this and do we know how to make that and it was a day out for them, definitely. I was there to get my Vegemite in and out, but yeah, a lot of people <laughs> are really there to enjoy their food shopping. And I think that's not something we do in New Zealand, is it, Catherine? I think you just try to get to the supermarket, park your car, get in, get out as soon as you yeah, can. It's yeah. not really a place where you take your time and have a leisurely experience. And mm. so it's a really different one, isn't it, to go into Kaldi, for example. You always know you're going to spend more time having mm. a look around and seeing what's there. And there's usually samplings, uh, but it's a really fun place to investigate. 
yeah, always you can have find a new innovation sure. uh, that it's have a impression you may be able to cook by yourself some uh, the very interesting foods and yeah. you never tried to cook at home. So inspirational place, I would say. Is there yeah, anything like, then that, you know, Kiwi exporters in particular, because they are Kiwis, they have a kind of X factor. Is there anything that New Zealanders bringing in premium food products here can utilize as their X factor here? Uh, the Kaudi or the Game Super experience shows that the people are really open to the innovative ideas. I think New Zealanders also can think of the new packaging or the new taste or the new innovative types of the products, not not just selling only one your traditional products, but also can add some more, a little twist of your ideas and a little different the seasonal packaging and that kind of thing. The Ruby Red, I explained, it uh, has a very seasonal uh, attribute. So that attracts people. So that kind of seasonality or the new or the, the little different packaging is uh, always welcomed by the Japanese consumers. Maybe one example is Coca-Cola is in the international space. They are releasing around 500 new products per year. And one fifth of that, 100 products per year is only for the Japanese market. Wow. So mm. the Japanese market is only account 8% of Coke's global business. So it's really a twice or three times more new products they need to put into the Japanese market in mm. order to keep attraction from the consumers. Mm. Wow, wow, wow. We mm. do, I see a lot of Coca-Cola different labeling. Yeah. Like we would never see in any other country, mm. you know, mm. what seem like kind of strange flavors, but it seems to be very <laughs> yeah. popular, right? And sell in Japan. And you're right. They're looking at innovation here and they want the new latest thing. So I get that. Yes, consumers are really open for that kind of things and I want to try out something new, always. <laughs> so can you give us some key tips that people can use to help them on their entry to the Japan market? What are the things they need to be careful about around importing goods into Japan? Especially for food, there's a strict restriction about the ingredients and food additives and agrochemical residues and that kind of thing. So you need to be very careful to fit with the Japanese regulations at the very beginning of exporting. Uh, but uh, after that, once you have a loyal, good customer, they tend to be loyal, continue importing for many years may happen. So that the first step is really important to fit with mm. the Japanese regulations. Where does one find these regulations? Is there a one-stop shop for <laughs> the regulations? Or is it... Jane, thank you for pointing out that. But uh, actually, there are quite a couple of different government divisions are handling food safety, like a Minister of Health and the Minister of Agriculture, etc. So it's not very easy for the exporters to find a one-stop things. But uh, in order to help them, that uh, we... Actually, that is for the United States government, but the, the embassy asked us to make a guide for the exporters, and mm. we published 24 different guides for each different food products, so you can refer to that at the moment. We just updated last year, so I think it's still good enough to <laughs> to refer to. Ultimately, that the importer, it's importer's role to take the older responsibility, but the exporter also not. I think it's very helpful for exporters to know what will happen in the next and what kind of data or the information you need to share to the exporters. And those are the written in that guide. So I can share the link later with the audience. Wow, that it's, sounds like mm -hmm. a gold mine of information for people <laughs> to be able to find their way to get started with that. That's amazing. And in mm. your business, what do you do to help people? We haven't talked about that. <laughs> I mean, you're a food and beverage import mm. specialist. And so what does that entail? And how do you help budding exporters come into Japan? We are a strategic advisor. For, so we help the entire process from the identify market and the narrow down the 
the segments you want to target, etc. And we cannot do just much making only, but uh, sometimes we help the exporters to dig a regulation, etc. And including the whole strategic support is our strengths. And uh, we also often support embassies when they help the small exporters. And actually, New Zealanders is you know, very lucky. You have a really nice uh, the organization, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. They support medium to small size enterprises in a very dedicated way. And we often collaborate with them to support the medium size, but the quite strong industry like uh, the company who are selling possum fiber. We help them together with NZT and we did the market study and the identification of the players and NZT provide more dedicated support or the making matchmaking or that uh, on, online meetings or that that's kind of the NZT arranged that kind of part. So you can count on that. <laughs> your well, um, thanks government. to NZT mm-hmm. that I met you, right? We did a, we, you and I and uh, Craig Pettigrew, we did a, a webinar for the ANZ CCJ, the Australian New Zealand Chamber of Commerce in Japan, a couple yes. of years ago. Yes. Uh, and that's how I got to meet you and knew that you would be fabulous to have on the show today, too. So it's really great to see you continuing the collaborations there and helping the governments locally here through mm. Embassy in the way. It's fantastic. Yeah, they have a great team and uh, with the lo- the strong local members as well. Sure. Mm. And anything broadly then more about any gold mines or real opportunities, two or three that you can see for New Zealanders coming in here as we start to wrap up the chat. With you. Is there anything <laughs> there that you can say, look, you guys in New Zealand do this. This is coming around the corner. We really recommend you think about these things. Mm, now, one thing is really... Uh, agri-tech innovation in the technology in the production side. So that is the area that the Japanese industry is really need, needed. Mm-hmm. And another area is the health-oriented, uh, the food tech, and also the innovation in food technology, upcycling, or the, the, those kind of sustainable tech and health-related to innovative food products mm. uh, that uh, will be welcomed by the Japanese or Japanese industry, I, th- I think, mm-hmm. and consumers. And handy snacks for health. Handy snacks for health. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> at the, that's, that's energy a good point. Mm. Yeah. There's, when you're looking for a snack, often there are junky things, aren't they, if you're in the convenience yeah. store? Yeah. Mm. And also thinking about the health, so it's better to take uh, raw vegetables and uh, cook by yourself is much healthier, but the people are not looking for that kind of solutions. The people are looking for some more much handy Solutions. Handy solutions. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, cooking veggie by yourself is not the solution people are paying money for, actually. So, the handy, easy ones for kids or the people at the office and that they don't have much time. So, these days, so a handy, healthy snacking food products are there. And one of the key trends these days and yeah then, let's see more of those mm. i you know i keep looking and all there is is chocolate or something too yeah. heavily in sugar or carbohydrate i want more of mm. those so come mm. on kiwis yes innovation <laughs> and health sustainable tech all of this into japan we are waiting for you now the gates are, are just about <laughs> to be open yes. excellent anything else chisa that we haven't talked about that you you meant to mention and we missed it out anything else that we can uh, add in at the end uh, here Okay, this, so I appreciate a lot that the, you call, uh, you called at me and uh, one of my personal resolution of this year was to increase output at the public space and uh, not for my direct client. And uh, there's still a big, big information gap between the Japan and New Zealand, I think, that uh, due to the language barrier. And I started to feel like I may be able to contribute to that space. And I became, a, this year, I became a director of international affairs for the Japanese Agricultural Journalist Association. Mm. And that's my personal, <laughs> as my personal volunteer activities. There's not yes. many, mm, Jap- not many journalists who want to speak about Japanese agriculture in English. Mm. So I thought it's maybe there's some. I can contribute to the 
more better international collaboration in this space. Well, so. that's great. I mean, that and, you know, your exposure on the, as the appetizer too. <laughs> right? I mean, that is great exposure as a journalist. And they know, they will have people that they can tell, right, when they need to know the person who's mm. the expert on the ground, you're the go-to. That is really fantastic. Mm-hmm. Well done for achieving your personal goals this year right? and working towards them. That's always very important. And we really want to congratulate you, Chisa, on you and your business, Meros Consulting, on what you do to help people in Japan who are New Zealanders coming in uh, and you're Jandal now. You officially are a Jandal. Thank you very much for sharing your success wow. here with us. Wow, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I was. I wish I can become an active member of Jandals. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank we'd you. love to hear from you. And I think you've already talked about the guides that you've got, so we'll put those out there for everybody to see. But thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really happy to share my insights. So please contact us through social media or the email. Anything is okay. Mm -hmm. Great. We'll put those in the show notes too. (laughs) Thank you so much, Shisa. Thank Thank you, you. Jane, Kathleen. Thank you. All righty, Catherine, where shall we start with that? That was an amazing episode with Chisa. As we said at the beginning, Gosh, you know, if you're going to go to someone who's an expert in all this area and food and bev in Japan, you just can't go past Meros Consulting. And mm. she's, uh, isn't she amazing? That's awesome. And she just dropped that in there. We have 24 guides. I'm like, what? <laughs> That's right. an amazing resource there. Just so it, it sounds like anybody can access, download. Sounds it like it. And I mean, it sounds like somebody, uh, the US government paid for these to be made and now they're available. Um, yeah. I would just be jumping in there as soon as possible and seeing what's inside. Um, we'll pick up a few and see what's in there mm. too. Okay? Yeah, definitely. Wow, wonderful. Yeah, so Japanese food security huge issue here in japan and like i said i see it with my own eyes every day the farmers in this country are very elderly they're over 70. she said 68 is the average age 68 that's right yeah you would not believe some of the elderly people and i don't i'm not being rude here but they're very genki they have full of energy and doing their farming but it is hard work right hard hard work so yeah there's mm. a tv program on in japan which is the little house that's out in the middle of nowhere Mm -hmm. ah yes yeah and i love that program but whenever they go out to the the country 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 area they find the little jichan and bachan there's a little elderly couple and they're the ones they ask for the directions to the house that they're trying to get to that's the Mm. one that's isolated from everything and it amazes me every time how elderly the farming mm. people are, but that's the situation, right? That's yeah. in New Zealand's. Uh, I saw something in the the press or the Herald about uh, that as well. That New Zealand's farming population is also getting older, older. Oh, and older. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm. 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 Yeah. Well, that was very interesting. The food security, and also she talked about you couldn't miss the innovation in agri tech, and it sounds like that's really one goldmine area that New Zealanders can get into. And she gave the example there too of the robotics company. Mm. Wow. I mean, if that can be adopted more broadly, mm. what else could we think about that that could work with? Maybe that yeah. company and other companies thinking of it. I think that's one of the, you know, those two things, food security mm-hmm. and innovative tech that was really brought out so well from her. Yeah. And also the success of the Zespri Kiwi brothers. <laughs> yeah. I, I think if, if you're going to bring your brand into Japan, you need a mascot. Right. If you've got a mascot, I'm sorry, mascots are so popular. It's like if it we doesn't have about a mascot. This with the native sparkling boys, didn't yeah, we? Yeah. We're like, can you make a mascot of your little thing and have it? Yeah. Someone wear it and walk around with it on. <laughs> it have a lot of impact. But it's amazing what a mascot Seriously. can do for your brand in yeah. Japan. Mm. Yeah. It really softens the approach for people too. Even some of the mm. more, like you think of the police department and the shows, right? The mm. municipal officers, they all have little characters as well. And yeah. they make it more approachable to go and see those people, go to the police station, go to those places. There's one for blood donation, right? It's like, like, oh, that's so cute. Yes. I don't mind giving my blood because there's a ma- mascot there. I know mm. it's not as simple as that, but it really makes things more approachable for people if they see it in a character form. It yeah. certainly does. Yes, our city has about three or four 
different mascots. You know, every city has a mascot. Everything has a mascot. There's an Instagram <laughs> channel for um, mascots I'm following. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I've had a few photos of mascots. Have you not seen them all? I am a mascot. Oh, you like Man. them? Oh, yeah. I'm not fussed by them at all, but my kids oh, yeah, when they were little would, would make me take photos with them. I'm like, are you not scared of this? And, you know, they're thoroughly into it. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, it was really great to hear her. I think the other thing she talked about was, you know, on the innovation aspect was, you know, look at new tastes and different packaging. And she called it a twist of ideas. I loved that, adding a mm. twist of ideas uh, and bringing in seasonality. We've talked about seasonality yes. at the beginning there as mm. well today. Really interesting to think about that. And uh, I mean, someone like Chisa would be able to give you the next step, how to do that. What would look yeah. good for your particular product? Well, how can you package it up and dress it up to look good? Mm. Mm. It's interesting that we're getting sort of two messages here. It's don't change the brand, but also be seasonal. Yeah. How do you manage that, right? Like don't do running changes or don't change things, but also be seasonal. So how do you balance that? act and obviously experts like chisa can tell you how to do that so that's something to be aware of isn't it like really good point yeah 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 mm. interesting and then i think the well she talked about going to experts finding out the regulations for example i mean yeah. you would be silly to go any further and try and find out where things are buried in japan i mean i know that as a lawyer it's hard to find everything because they're all captured somewhere amongst different regulations and different government organizations and divisions look after this. Mm. So if you've got someone like that, why not put the money on the table, get the advice and have it all in one stop shop that she can provide. Mm. Uh, it's hard to find that anywhere else, as she said, regulations, mm -hmm. getting to know them. And then after that, once that's done, you get the loyalty from customers following you. Yeah, it's interesting. There are other, there are new ways to go about this. You could work with someone like Costco mm. if you mm. have the volume. Yeah. And that, in fact, I think volume is the, the key with Costco, right? And they, you have to be able to provide a lot, but it could be a way to get your products into Japan. Certainly could. And it's sustainability too, right? Making sure that you've got consistency on being able to sustain that Costco market. But it sounds mm -hmm. like with wine and meat that New Zealand is doing that, at least so far. So there's some yeah. good examples. Produce there. and things. Yep, definitely. Mm. Perfect. What a great session that Fantastic. was. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chisa. All right. Thanks, we Chisa, have so much. Lots of exciting guests coming up, don't we? We oh my goodness, the lineup is amazing. Keep listening and we'll see you again soon. See you soon, everyone. Bye. Kia ora. For listening make sure you check out our guests links in the show notes this podcast is brought to you today by Catherine o'connell law and pod launch with jane if you have a great story you think should be on the show come and find us on linkedin or instagram we'd love to hear from you see you next time matane